Okay, now uh, I guess um, we give it a start right now. So hello once again and uh, welcome to our initial session of the PML School. Learn how to build custom PK and PKPD models in, in Phoenix Vernon on Lynn. Uh, my name is Bernd Wendt and uh, together with my colleague Chris Mehl, uh, we will be running a series of webinars for this new school. Uh, today we are pleased to have Dan Weiner here with us who will be giving the first seminar, so he will present the first model. Um, but before we begin with the seminar, I would like to give you an introduction of uh, what the PML School is all about. Uh, you may ask at first, why do we have a PML School now? The idea around the PML School was initiated in discussions with you, our users. Uh, we talked with you uh, while giving training courses or specifically at the recent Phoenix Roadshow events, you uh, actually stated explicitly that there is a gap when you try to use the Phoenix model engine. So we identified this topic to be one of major interest. And um, this seems to be justified by the overwhelming response that we've received from our invitation to join this PML school. So I, at this point, I would like to thank everyone for the interest in this uh, webinar series. O over the next slides, I will present the format that we've envisioned for this school. But we would love to get feedback on you, our seminars from you that would allow us to steer the sessions into the right directions. You can use several channels to pro provide feedback. Um, during our sessions, uh, you have the Q&A panel. You know, on, you f you'll find it on the right-hand side of the WebEx window. But after the event, uh, you can use our Satara forum or our support wo web portal uh, for giving feedback. And finally, you can also send me a personal message if you prefer. So let me switch over to the next slide. So PML, uh, people might not be familiar with the acronym. Uh, PML stands for Phoenix Modeling Language, and it is a language that is used to run the Phoenix model engine. Uh, typically, uh, learning uh, a new lang language is a tedious and lengthy exercise. For, for any starter, it represents a high entry barrier. Our ultimate goal for the PML school is to lower the entry barrier to turn uh, new modelers into hopefully happy users and quickly. And I think the uh, Phoenix modeling language is, is a candidate where you can really um, shorten the time to, to learn it. Uh, the venue for the PML school will be a series uh, uh, of live webinars. Our plan is to keep these webinars short and concise. But at the same time, uh, we want to make it as interactive as possible. Sorry, I just need to share my event window. Sorry, yeah. So, um, uh, as we guess that these webinars uh, will only take about maybe 20, 30 minutes each. Uh, depending on the time uh, for the Q&A session. But this may change based on your feedback, so we can ad adjust that. Uh, we are planning uh, to run a webinar every two weeks. Over the next week, we will send out a new invitation to all registrants to invite you to our webinar schedule until the end of the year. Uh, we are planning for another five sessions this year, until the end of this year. And uh, this is followed by yet another 14 sessions in uh, 2017. So in, um, oops. in this, um, uh, so on this slide, uh, uh, I, I, I want to show you, I mean, how, why we think uh, it should be a short pass um, to, um, should be a short pass um, to learning, uh, to adopting the PML language. And a second. Sorry, can, 
Uh, Dan, can you see this screen or? Yes. Okay. Um, there's some comments in the Q&A box that people cannot see the presentation. So I think this should be okay. So let me see. Maybe, maybe you can try putting it down in full screen mode for them. Yeah, okay. I've put it now in full screen mode. So you should actually see this now. Um, so um, the, the, here's the trick. I mean, everything you know in in, in Phoenix is connected. So you, you typically start with it in the top left hand corner with the built in options. And these are uh, related uh, with the graphical model. You, you, you typically you have a um, a picture of this uh, available, and uh, the graphical model is then connected with actually the textual model. So these three are interchangeable. They they, they are just um, different uh, representations of the same. Uh, and um, the um, the Phoenix model engine actually just executes the textual code. Uh, the the others, I mean, are just there for for your uh, b better user interface. So when we are typically building up a, a new model from scratch, we will always start with the built-in options. Here we can choose the number of compartments, the route of administration, and amongst other things. And this already covers a variety of different models that you can build. But uh, then when you've exploited all built-in options, we switch over to the graphical model builder, where we can addition, add additional compartments, like observations, flows, uh, parameters, or procedures, just by picking from the menu and then linking it to, to the model. But the final step will always be to switch to the textual model. We will explain the individual parts of the textual model by showing what is required in which part and what is actually the syntax of the individual lines of the commands. In most cases, um, only very few and tiny changes have to be made in the textual model. But it's, it's these little steps that you need when you're faced with a new situation and you have to build up your model on your own. And we believe that we can uh, transfer this knowledge to you. So um, we have selected a set of 20 very common scenarios in modeling. And we were very grateful to uh, Dan Weiner, who gave us permission to pick exercises from his book of pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic data analysis. Uh, the book has recently been released in its fifth edition and is uh, really a standard reference for uh, PKPD modeling. Uh, the book is actually, um, there are two main sections, a theoretical part and, and an exercise part. part. And, and the exercises cover um, 100 different exercises with all sorts of modeling scenar scenarios. Um, and these are obviously uh, explained uh, in all detail. Uh, the book also comes with a USB stick that contains all the exercises in the form of Phoenix project files. We've been granted permission by the publisher to present 20 of these exercises in live seminars and we can make the models available in text form. Uh, it goes without saying that without this contribution, our little PM school uh, would be unthinkable. So I want to express my sincere thanks to both uh, Johan and, and Dan. Um, how did we select the 20 models that we want to share with you? Uh, we reviewed all support cases that we received uh, from you over the past four years, and uh, you can imagine this is a very large number. Um, we then assigned each of the modeling questions to relevant exercises in the book, and then all exercises were ranked according to the frequency of associated support cases. From this ranking, we selected the top 10 PK as well as the top 10 PD or PKPD models uh, and, and this is a basis of our um, PML school. Uh, so this table gives you an overview of the selected models where you can see the typical suspects like uh, three compartmental model. Actually, this is the um, uh, seminar that uh, Dan will uh, give uh, in a few minutes. But also the other ones like a simultaneous fitting of IV and PO data, TMDD models, um, 
tumor growth inhibition models, this kind of thing. So um, this is coming next, and um, what during the live webinar, we want uh, um, to present these on a biweekly basis. And we start actually in October, as we are here right now. But the whole series will take us at least into August 27 for the final seminar. Um, as already pointed out, we will uh, present the model exercise in three stages. So we start with the built-in options, then followed by the graphical model builder, and finally the textual model. Uh, we will also give directions how to get to initial estimates for the uh, final parameter for the model parameters. Um, after each event, we will make available uh, the materials uh, in our Satara forum, uh, where we've created a new category around the PML school. This is a link for to, to it, um, and you will also be given a link to the recorded webinar, and uh, we will upload the textual model. Uh, as a text file for download, and these text files can be directly imported into the Phoenix model, uh, and then be used with different data sets, and we will show you how to do this. Uh, the forum uh, will allow you uh, to discuss and exchange over each session and model, so questions, comments, and responses will be posted there. Alternatively, you can send also questions to our support email address at support at .com or use uh, web portal, uh, uh, the link is given here. Um, I'm almost finished with the introduction of the PML school. Here comes just a minor but important point. Uh, we deliberately made changes to some of the models as they are written in the book. First, we only use clearance parameterization for the model building. As you will see, if you have the book and at your hands, the parameterization changes between exercises. Uh, secondly, for some exercises in the book, the model is built using closed form uh, algebraic models. And in order to be consistent throughout our series, uh, we have converted all those models to differential equations. Please keep those changes in mind when you can compare our models with those in the book. So this is it. I'm now at the end of my introduction to the PM School. Uh, here's just a summary. Uh, so we are introducing a new webinar series to the user community where we want to present you 20 selected exercises from Johan Gabrielsson and Dan Weiner's book. Models that have been selected on the basis of their frequency uh, in, in support. All those models will be presented in live webinars that will be scheduled on a biweekly basis from October 2016 to August 2017. And the Satara Forum has been chosen as a place where we can exchange not only the materials of the individual seminars, but also where we can discuss questions and answers. And as a final point, some of the models have been revised, so please be aware when you compare it with the original exercise in the book. So this is now time for me to stop, and I want to hand over to Dan Weiner. I don't need to introduce Dan here as he's the well-known thought leader in the PKPD world. So Dan will be presenting around an exciting topic, nonlinear clearance and a three-compartment model. So Dan, uh, please take over. The, the stage is yours. So I'll just hand over the rights to you. Just... All right, thanks, Dan. OK. All right, so the example that I'm going to cover for you today is one of them that is in the uh, textbook that Johan and I did. This is PK24. Uh, in this situation, we're going to use a three compartment model uh, to model the data, but the wrinkle in this particular exercise is that we're going to assume that the clearance of the group is not linear. So we talk about how to implement that um, uh, using the PML code. In this particular instance, the drug is known to reduce the cardiac output uh, and also hepatic blood flow, and that's the rationale behind uh, the nonlinear clearance. So, but as part of the exercise, we will fit both a static uh, three-compartment model where clearance is static as well as a model uh, where clearance is uh, flow or concentration dependent. 
and we'll briefly talk about how to obtain initial estimates and then we'll compare fits of the models. In this particular data set, we have data from one healthy volunteer. Uh, they received a single intravenous uh, infusion of 10,000 micrograms per kilogram that was administered over a two-hour period. And then uh, placement samples were collected at various times after dosing. Here is a plot of what the data looks like on semi-lobe scale. You can see that uh, the data is actually very well behaved. Uh, this is not the fitted model. Here the points are just uh, connected directly. Uh, but of course, we're going to go ahead and fit a model to the data. So with regards to initial estimates, I don't want to take up uh, a lot of, uh, you know, your time today talking about how to do that. They are derived in detail in the textbook, and the actual derivations are on pages 592 and 593. Um, but I, if, I will say that um, the way that we approached getting initial estimates was to start uh, by doing uh, uh, an NCA analysis. And then in addition to doing an NCA analysis, we used curve stripping techniques in order to come up with the initial estimates uh, of the parameters. And the initial estimates that were derived are the ones that are displayed on the screen now. I will say that the Phoenix developers have really done an excellent job of developing the UI uh, for the Phoenix modeling engine. And I think if, if you haven't done much modeling, I think you're going to find it's probably going to meet your needs maybe 80% or more percent of the time. It's an extremely uh, well-designed and robust interface with lots of flexibility and options. But having said that, you are going to encounter situations where you can't quite get to the final model you want via the GUI, and that, of course, uh, is the rationale behind the PML school, where we're going to give you instruction in uh, how to actually uh, modify uh, models using the PML language. In this particular instance, although only the multiplicative error model is shown here, we will fit both additive and multiplicative error models, and then we'll figure out which one is a better fit. And then, of course, we will convert clearance uh, to be uh, uh, nonlinear. So here's what the actual output looks like uh, for the additive and multiplicative error models. And as you can see, the additive uh, error model has a serious deficit. It doesn't fit the terminal phase uh, really uh, at all. And when you switch them to a multiplicative error model, you see then that the uh, terminal phases actually fit very well, and in addition, it hasn't compromised the fit to the higher concentrations, which is important and something you should always uh, uh, consider when you're doing weighting. Now, you might ask then, well, why don't you just stop with, with this particular static error model? It actually gives a good fit to the data. Uh, however, if you look at the diagnostic plots, they don't look so good. And mechanistically, we do know that cardiac output is reduced and hepatic blood flow were reduced by this drug. So we have a mechanistic reason uh, to believe that the clearance is not static. Uh, Bert uh, covered this already, but I just want to just reemphasize it here. The easiest way to get to a final model is always start with a built-in library model. And here, of course, we're going to choose a three-compartment IV infusion model. And then, if necessary, convert it to a graphical model. It's very uh, easy to do edits in the graphical mode. And the nice thing about editing the model is all the equations for you. And then, if you can't get to the final model you need in graphical mode, then switch to the textual mode and doing your final edits. Um, if you follow this approach, it's greatly uh, going to speed up the model building process, but it also reduces the potential for coding errors and the need to do the validation of the coding of the model. Now, in this particular instance, uh, given the nature of uh, how we're going to implement the flow-dependent clearance, the graphical model won't enable us to do that, so we're going to go directly from the built-in library model, in this instance, directly to a textual model. And I'll actually show you then the edits that are uh, needed in order to get to the final model. So in this case, what you're looking at is, is a uh, conversion of the PML code uh, that the GUI uh, generates uh, for the three-compartment IV infusion model. And then I've made a, a series of edits to the model as well. 
So we'll go through these uh, for you. Um, all models uh, start with a, a test statement and an opening brace and they end with a closing brace. That's just a placeholder. You could actually name these anything you want, um, but that's just the default uh, naming convention. Then the first three derivative statements, uh, those represent a, the derivative uh, of, of these corresponding functions with respect to time. And you see we have three differential equations here. A1, and I'm sure you, uh, I'm sure you um, recognize the actual equation, but that, of course, is for the amount of drug in the central or plasma compartment. A2 and A3 then represent the corresponding amounts uh, in the two tissue compartments. So that comprises the three compartment systems. Now, the way that the differential equations are implemented for PKPD models uh, in Phoenix, we model amounts and then we convert them uh, to concentrations. And you see those below where you see the C, C2, and C3 equations where you have then amount divided by volume. If, the, if I had to point my finger to what I think is the most important aspect of the PML language, it would be this dose point statement uh, as shown here. The dose point um, enables the computer program, enables Phoenix to really handle all of the dosing for you sort of behind the scenes. So for example, if you're doing multiple dosing, uh, in old classic wing on then you had to code loops uh, to handle the multiple dosing. But here, dose point handles multiple, not only multiple dosing for you, but it also handles uh, different routes. So for example, in this case, we have dose point A1, and A1 represents plasma. So that means we're either going to do a bolus dose or an infusion. On the other hand, if this had been an extravascular model, then we would have had an additional differential equation, AA, for the amount uh, that's absorbed in it. We could have had a dose point AA. Um, you can also have multiple dose point statements. For example, you may have a model whereby drug could be administered either extravascularly or intravenously, or perhaps you've got a, a two different drugs that are being administered both into the same compartment, such as plasma or the gut, and again, you can use dose points to handle those. We're not going to discuss those today, um, but those types of situations will be covered in subsequent exercises as part of the PML school. Now, the differential equation, as you see above, the very first one has clearance there. So if I hadn't modified the code, it would use clearance just to be a static uh, parameter. But in this instance, um, because of the fact that the drug is affecting cardiac output, uh, for example, and hepatic uh, blood flow, we're going to assume that clearance decreases uh, as a function of plasma concentration. And in this case, we used a very simple function, namely that clearance is equal to a baseline clearance. That's clearance at time zero minus A times C. So A is the slope of the decrease in clearance as a function of plasma concentration. So that's how we're implementing the time dependencies and flow dependencies in this particular instance. The next statement, the error statement, is just a uh, mechanism to uh, define the initial condition uh, for the error standard deviation. And then the observed statement defines the actual sort of uh, error model. And in this instance, as you can see, uh, we've elected to use a multiplicative error model. And we saw the rationale for that on the prior slide where the additive model did not give a very good fit. The next set of parameters uh, that start with the name STPARM stand for structural parameters. Um, and here you see that we have uh, five structural parameters. One I have commented out, uh, that was for static clearance, uh, because now, of course, in this particular model, we're not treating uh, clearance as being static. Um, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, STPARM parameters on the next slide in more detail. For now, if you could, just take it on faith that these are just placeholders when you're doing wind non modeling, where you're fitting individual subjects. Uh, but the STPAR parameter, structural parameters, give us the ability to incorporate covariates when we're doing population PK uh, and population PKPD models. And as I said, I've got another slide to give you an example of that. The fixed Dan, Dan, th this is this is Chris. We have a few attendees reporting that they can't see the slides. Would you be able to reshare them? 
Okay, so right now, Chris, um, let me see here. So what I'm going to do, Chris, I'm going to um, I'm going to go to my own deck that I'm sharing. Let me scroll down. Are you able to see the slides now? Yes, yes, I can see them, and we have uh, some attendees in Q&A saying that they can now see the presentation. Um, if, if, right. if you're having trouble, there's a, there's a tab that says Dan Weiner's slide deck at the top of the WebEx, so just simply click on that tab, and it should uh, display the slides. If not, please let us know. Yeah, so my apologies for that. Um, so rather than using the slides that were uploaded to WebEx, I'm just uh, I'm doing the version now. It's directly on my laptop. So apologies uh, uh, if, if you had difficulty seeing the slides. So where we're at now, we're talking about the fixed effects, the FIXEF. And the fixed effects um, have a uh, composite structure that C just is a placeholder in, in the PML language that denotes a class, that just denotes complex input. And in this case, it, it allows for three inputs for each fixed effect of parameter. So the first parameter that it allows for input would be like a lower bound for the parameter. Uh, then you have the initial estimate and then the upper bound. So in this particular instance, uh, for the A parameter, which is the slope on clearance, uh, we've elected to not give a lower bound. That's why there's just a comma. Uh, the initial estimate is 0 .0005, and then we have a comma again and, and an open space uh, where we're not using an upper bound. But these are placeholders in the event that you want to include a, a, a lower upper bound or not. The way the algorithms work, not only in Phoenix, but in other programs to do this type of modeling, uh, they generally work best in an unbounded space. Uh, so we encourage you to start by not using bounds. And then uh, if there are difficulties with convergence and you need to use bounds, of course, you've got placeholders here where you can actually do that. So these names of the parameters, the default names, uh, have these TVs in the front. That just stands for typical value. Uh, again, these are placeholders uh, in terms of nomenclature for when you're doing population modeling. And again, just as I commented out the structural parameter for clearance, uh, I'm commenting out here the structural fixed effect for clearance uh, as well, because of course we're no longer using a static clearance model. And then lastly, um, one of the nice features uh, in, in the PML language is the ability to define functions of the fixed effects that you're interested in. And we call those secondary parameters. So here, for example, the way we've modeled clearance, it, it decreases as a function of plasma concentration. And if we had gone back and looked at a plot of the data, the maximum plasma concentration is around 100. So I then estimated as a secondary parameter, what is the smallest clearance that we would expect to see uh, over the course of this profile? And that would be the baseline clearance CL0 minus the slope times 1,000. And in a minute, when we look at the demo, I'll show you where to find that type of, uh, that type of output. Also note that the hash mark or pound statement um, can uh, signify that you're using comments. And anything that appears after that hash statement then uh, becomes a comment uh, in the code. So I mentioned that I had a slide on structural parameters. Again, we're not really using them in this example. They're just placeholders, as I said, for future population modeling. Uh, but some of our subsequent examples uh, will talk about these in more detail. Um, so generally speaking, as I said, um, structural parameters uh, help you uh, define situations where your model structural parameters are parameters of covariates or functions of covariates. So the example I've illustrated here is, let's suppose volume is not a static parameter, but rather volume is computed as a function of body weight. So here, the way we, uh, one could model volume is to we have a parameter times body weight normalized to 70 kilogram raised to the V power, so it's allometrically scaled. And then we have times the E to an eta term for volume that could incorporate between subject variability. Uh, so in situations like this where you want to model uh, volume, say, as a function of 
uh, body weight or clearance, perhaps as a function of age, the structural parameters uh, facilitate doing that. And in these particular instances, such as here, volume is not estimated directly as a parameter. Rather, A and B are the parameters that are estimated. And then, of course, uh, we can derive an estimate of volume uh, based on an individual's body weight. So this just shows the uh, summary of the output from fitting the static model uh, with the uh, model where clearance was a function of plasma concentration. And you can see that the minus two log likelihood is significantly reduced. Uh, this is actually a nested model because if A is set equal to zero, uh, it reduces to the static model. Uh, and with one degree of freedom, we only need a chi-square value of about 3.8 to be significant. And here we've got a reduction of 31. So we have a, a fit that's uh, markedly uh, statistically better. Of course, the AIC is somewhat better as well. And then I made a table of the corresponding uh, estimates for you. Uh, so you can see what the estimates of the parameters are. They're all estimated uh, uh, quite well. One thing I will point out, if you look at the estimated error standard deviation, uh, it's reduced from 0.03 to 0.015, so about, you know, by a 50% reduction in the error variance. And that was through inclusion of the A term, the slope term. Uh, it helped explain a lot of the uh, unexplained variability in the prior model. So at this point, I'm going to jump into the demo. So um, Chris, can you confirm you're able to see Phoenix? Or Burke, can you confirm? Yeah, uh, we can see the screen very clearly. Yeah. Thank yes, you. Right, great. Good. Thank you. All right, great. So here's the actual data set. Uh, if you've been using Phoenix, of course, you know that uh, it uses a format sort of similar to Excel, uh, but it does manage units for you as well in the data sets. Uh, so here we have plasma concentration in units of microgram per liter and time and hours. Um, the next thing one normally would do uh, is a plot of the data, and you saw the plot uh, in the PowerPoint slides. And as you can see, um, uh, we have an infusion up to about two hours, and then it falls off in a multiphasic uh, decline. The next thing I would do is go through and do a non-compartmental analysis. I'm not going to go through this in detail for you now. It isn't really part of the, of the PML school. I want to get to the actual PML aspects. Um, and then I made a, just a little table of some of the NCA parameters that I utilized uh, in the course of deriving initial estimates for the model. So here we see the GUI um, to set up the basic three compartment model. Uh, so again, it's a library model. We have a PK library. We said we wanted clearance of parameterization. Route is intravenous, uh, three compartments. And you see the corresponding equations here. And as we uh, noted, when we convert the model, uh, that text will become editable. And in this case, we chose an additive error model. And then as we saw, when we looked at the uh, results in the PowerPoint, um, we really don't have a very good fit to the terminal phase. So then the nice thing uh, about Phoenix as well, and it's, it's, it's just part of the modeling architecture, is that you can make a copy of the model uh, and then paste it and then rename it and then just change the uh, error term to multiplicative. And then in addition, you have the ability here under um, fixed effects, under the initial estimates, you can accept all, so it'll use final estimates from the prior model as initial estimates in this model, which again is a, is a beautiful, uh, nice feature that's been built into the system. Um, there are also uh, modules uh, to allow you to further refine your initial estimates so you can actually uh, try different initial estimates and, and, and see how the actual curve changes as a function of initial estimates. So then I fit the multiplicative error model. Um, and then as we saw in the PowerPoint slide, uh, we get a beautiful fit of the model to the data. But mechanistically, it doesn't account for the fact that cardiac output uh, is changing as a function of drug concentration. So at this point, the way I got to the next model, I made a copy of this model, um, pasted it in, and then I just clicked on this button, edit as textual. 
And that is the model that we were just looking at uh, previously in PowerPoint. So then I had the model here in textual form. Let me see if I can scroll this over here a little bit. Um, and you're seeing the exact same code that was in the PowerPoint. I just copy and pasted these. Uh, so again, it's, it's a nice editable format. Um, if I needed to add a dose point statement, I can do it. You know, whatever edits you need to do, you can do directly uh, uh, here. And then we can run this model, and if you look at the results, um, uh, again, the fit of observed and predicted looks about the same, uh, but as we looked at in PowerPoint, um, if you look at the corresponding outputs side by side, um, not only is a, a khaki improved, and not only do we have a significant improvement of minus two log likelihood, if you just look at the slope itself, it's estimated uh, very, very precisely. Um, so here we have a, a much improved fit by allowing clearance to be uh, a function of plasma concentration. And in addition, if you look at the uh, results of the model, and if you scroll down here to secondary, here is that secondary parameter that I defined. And again, nice beauty of the architecture is that not only do we get an estimate of the minimum clearance, but you also get a standard error and CV percent um, of that as well. And that's really important because if you, if you got a parameter estimate without some measure of variability, um, it's, it's not near as valuable. And again, uh, the way we uh, did that uh, was to just find very simply the secondary statement here, just as a function in this case of these two fixed effects, uh, CL0 um, and A. So um, that concludes the demo. So um, at this point, um, okay, yeah. I'll turn, uh, uh, turn it back over to Burke then to for the Q and A session. That, yeah. that slides not in my deck, uh, Burke. All right. Uh, yes. Thanks, Dan. Uh, um, nice lecture. Uh, I'll hand actually uh, for the Q and A. I'll hand over to uh, Christopher Mill. So, Chris, will you start the Q&A session? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Bernd. Uh, so, this is an opportunity to ask questions. Um, Dan, the first question that came in via the Q&A is, uh, what is the A parameter in the linear clearance model, and how is it derived? Yeah, so what we're assuming here is that clearance de uh, declines in a linear fashion as a function of the plasma concentration, and the slope of that linear uh, decline is the parameter that we call A. In the way that Johan and I derived an initial estimate of A, uh, we knew that this drug over this concentration range should reduce cardiac output by about 10%. So we had the baseline clearance from NCA, and then we computed what 10% of that would be, and then, of course, we knew what the uh, estimate of A had to be in order to correspond uh, to a decrease of, of 10%. So that's how we came up with the initial estimate for A. Thanks. We, we have one more question. And if anyone else who's attending wants to ask more questions, uh, please use the Q&A tab to ask them. The next question, the PK parameters in the text model, are they case sensitive? Yes, um, unlike classical wind non um in the uh, PML language, all parameters are indeed case sensitive. Okay, thank you, Dan. Um, that, that's it for the questions for now. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks, Chris, um, and uh, thanks everyone for for joining. Um, I guess we've just kicked off uh, a new series, a PML school, and I'm really uh, looking forward and being excited for the next um, seminars, uh, for the next sessions. So, uh, as I said, um, the materials will be uh, made available. Um, you will get notified by email uh, in a few hours' time where to pick up the stuff, the textual model, and um, 
uh, the, the presentations as well as the uh, uh, recording of this webinar. Um, please um, uh, give us your feedback either through the forum, the support, or through personal message. Uh, we, we would like to get something, some, some feedback in order to um, see if we are making, uh, if the format is all right and maybe you've, you've got some other uh, queries that you want to get covered. This would be helpful information for us for the next sessions. So uh, thank you once again and hope to see you in a couple of weeks' time for the next session. Thank you. Bye.